Hi, I'm Dr. Rich Vogel, board certified neurophysiologist and co-founder and co-chair of the NAS sectional intraoperative neuromonitoring. This podcast, as most of our listeners know, is about neuromonitoring and covers a wide range of educational topics about optimizing patient care, decreasing costs, and optimizing OR efficiency. Today, I'm proud to be joined by Dr. Larry Lanky. He is arguably the world's foremost expert in spinal deformity surgery. He's world-renowned for his treatment in pediatric and adult patients with various forms of spinal anomalies, including the most complex of spinal deformities. He's also chair of the NAS section, or I believe co-chair of the NAS section on spinal deformity. He joins us today from New York Presbyterian Columbia, where he holds numerous academic and administrative titles, including surgeon in chief. Dr. Lenke, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to participate in this section of the podcast. It's an honor to have you on today. Oh, glad to be with you, Dr. Seaton Rich. So I want to talk about um, a couple different things today, uh, some techniques that you use in, uh, in, in, in neuromonitoring to guide your surgical procedures. Um, but I thought it'd be nice to just kind of start by asking an introductory question. How long have you been practicing as a spine surgeon and did you always use neuromonitoring during the course of your career? So I just started my 30th year of uh, uh, practicing spinal surgery uh, as an attending uh, surgeon. And uh, the answer is very easy. I've used basically spinal cord uh, neuromonitoring in every single uh, spinal uh, surgery procedure I've performed in my entire career. So that's a very easy answer. So, so that's, um, that kind of leads into the next question. I want to talk a little bit about some of the techniques that, that you've helped to, uh, in some ways, uh, popularize and in other ways, kind of rejuvenate. So um, two of those techniques are the, the descending neurogenic evoked potential and the dynamic spinal cord mapping. And both of those techniques in one way or another involve stimulating the spinal cord, whether it's directly or indirectly, and recording from uh, generally peripheral nerves in the leg, sciatic nerve of the popliteal fossil. And just for um, hi historical, um, uh, or maybe for rationale purposes for our audience, these techniques in one way or another have been around for approximately 40 years. And in the neuromonitoring world, they kind of declined in use as, as uh, um, transcranial motors were introduced in the 1990s. But your work has, um, has really demonstrated their, um, their clinical value and utility over the past uh, couple of decades and given them new life. So on the one hand, most people in neuromonitoring have kind of lost familiarity with how to do these tasks. And on the other hand, we're seeing an uptick in surgeons who are recognizing the importance and value of these techniques from, from, from what you've published and from what you've spoken about in various lectures. So let's start by differentiating between these two tests. Sure. The descending neurogenic evoked potential. Um, how have you used, what is it and how have you used that in the past? So uh, from 1992, when I started my practice, up until the time that I came uh, to Columbia University, which was uh, uh, 2015, uh, I used preferentially on all of my uh, spinal surgeries, uh, SCCPs, obviously, uh, upper and lower extremities, and descending neurogenic vocal potentials for low extremity, uh, what we call motor monitoring, knowing that's not exactly a motor response, as you all know, uh, it's carried uh, and, uh, retrograde by the uh, sensory tracts. But I can tell you, uh, in using this from 1992 through 2015, it was extremely reliable for motor function of the lower extremities, uh, you know, the DNEP. Uh, and so that, why, that is exactly why we use it um, uh, routinely in all of our spinal deformity corrections, even though, again, it uh, technically isn't a motor response, uh, similar to how the transcranial motor response is obviously a uh, a true motor response of the low extremities. But um, as a surrogate, I can tell you it was extremely accurate. Uh, if the DNEPs were intact, uh, at the end of the surgical procedure, the patient uh, had a normal uh, motor strength to the lower extremities. I can tell you that after doing thousands of cases with the uh, DNEPs. So uh, not exactly a pure motor response, but uh, a stronger correlate in surrogate as you could possibly have. And, and just as a, 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 from a purely technical perspective, we understand that this is a monitoring method. So you're, you're, you're recording these, these uh, evoked potentials throughout surgery. 
question. And my understanding is that your method was to either uh, place an electrode on the spinous process or at least between the, uh, the vertebrae uh, even before incision and you would stimulate uh, through those and record kind of continuously uh, the, the response from the, from the lower extremities, is that right? That, that is correct. So that was one advantage we could uh, obtain uh, pre-incision uh, 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 neurogenic evoke potential monitor uh, or signals um, as well. Although I can tell you that obviously uh, being farther away from the uh, spinal canal and not directly on the uh, dura is with an epidural uh, um, electrode, uh, uh, the responses weren't, weren't as, um, uh, as, as accurate or, uh, or reproducible as we took a uh, epidural catheter and placed it directly on the dura, which I tended to do on uh, much higher risk cases, I, I actually would, would bypass the spinous process based electrodes and go right to a, an epidural electrode, uh, especially in high risk cases, because that was much more reliable um, uh, in, uh, in, its, in, in, in be able to obtain and maintaining those responses. Sure, and, and my understanding now is as we transition to uh, your, your technique of dynamic spinal cord mapping, uh, you also use an epidural electrode for that too, right? So let us, um, uh, okay, so uh, let's talk about how you use this technique. So what, um, is there something that prompts you to, to begin using this technique? And then how, how do you kind of go about evaluating the functionality of the spinal cord? Sure. So basically uh, what the uh, dynamic spinal cord mapping can provide, provides me can provide really any uh, spinal surgeon is the ability to obtain localization or specificity in a, 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 in a, in a, in a, in a uh, area of uh, spinal cord uh, data loss or um, uh, degradation. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, all other forms of, of spinal cord uh, nerve monitoring are sensitive but not specific. They tell you somewhere between wherever you're um, uh, stimulating or wherever you're recording, there's a problem. Uh, and obviously, if, let's take transcranial motor vote potentials, probably one of the most accurate uh, means of, uh, of, of monitoring that we have. When you're stimulating the motor cortex and recording in various muscle groups of the arms and legs, all that means is that somewhere between the brain and the uh, muscles of the arms and legs, there's a problem. It doesn't give you any specificity. Is it, is it T12? Is it uh, T10? Is it T8? Uh, or, and such. Um, so uh, uh, so the bottom line is once, the, the way I use dynamic spinal cord mapping now is that if I do have degradation or loss of, uh, of transcranial motor data, uh, with or without the loss of SCCPs, you know that usually trails behind a bit in its uh, time frame. Uh, but if we do have <coughs> a, a, a loss of transcranial motors into warning criteria, criteria, and I am unable to improve those responses through typical things, raising blood pressure, making sure there's no uh, compression of, uh, of, of, of the dural sac uh, anywhere, make sure the spine isn't sublux, make sure I haven't overcorrected, things like that. If we go through all our checklists of common things that we do to try and improve the data, um, that's when I will uh, use dynamic spinal cord mapping because that can allow me uh, uh, to specify uh, uh, in a very narrow region, usually by one or two levels, exactly where uh, the uh, degradation or loss of data has occurred. Mm -hmm. And is the benefit of the uh, of the epidural electrode, um, which is kind of a, um, a, a pliable circumferential electrode, is the benefit there that you can kind of slide it under a lamina um, and and move it up and down the cord without having to expose that level of the cord? Exactly. Uh, so just with a tiny little uh, ligament flatectomy, uh, one or two millimeters, you can slide this very soft and pliable. Uh, electrode uh, up usually you know, not usually two three four levels uh, so I don't uh, you know slide it up ten levels I usually every three or four levels will make a small little laminotomy and sometimes we already have laminotomies done but, uh, uh, because we've done previous osteotomies or laminectomies already uh, so it's quite easy to just kind of place the electrode at very very locations uh, in the thoracic typically for my cases these are thoracic deformity corrections that are the problem so I'm putting it at various levels of the thoracic spinal column. Uh, and then basically I just localize. So I'll start out typically uh, at the top of my surgical field. Let's say I'm doing a T2 to L1 procedure. And I've lost data uh, and uh, I've done my normal um, uh, um, uh, 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 defaults for trying to get the data back and I haven't I've been able to get it back. Then I'll start at, at, at uh, T2, 3, put the electrode there, see if I have data. If I have no data, 
I go down to T4-5. Uh, if I have no data, I keep going down. And all of a sudden I get down to T9-10 and I have data. So I don't have data T7-8. I have data T9-10. The problem is between T7 and T9. Uh, so it's a very nice way of uh, getting more specific, either, usually within one or two levels, Rich. We can uh, uh, provide um, that type of specificity of where exactly uh, the loss of data has occurred. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I think that's something that, that I think a lot of our listeners can probably uh, can probably learn from is, uh, I know from my perspective, one of the more common criticisms that I hear about neural monitoring in general is that by the time there's some alert, whatever it is, a change in data that's indicative of an actual evolving injury, that it's too late to do anything about it, so neural monitoring is of no benefit. And it's, it's clear to me that, that um, and just by you nodding your head, I'll, I'll just allow you to respond. <laughs> yeah, so uh, before I left, uh, you know, I spent uh, 24 years at Washington University in San Luis, very, very a pleasant 24 years. It was a phenomenal part of my, my career, my life. Uh, and my um, uh, colleagues, Keith Bridwell and Dan Rue and I published a series uh, uh, of over 12,000 consecutive spinal surgery that we had monitored at Washington University. Uh, um, uh, uh, consecutively over the course of nearly 30 years of my uh, um, mentor, Keith Bridwell, had been in practice five or six years before I, I started my practice. So we had literally a 30-year experience, over 12,000 cases. What we found in that uh, study is that um, uh, we had lost data in approximately 400 cases out of the over 12,000. We had uh, either data met warning criteria or completely had been lost. And 93% of those cases um, uh, things were done uh, intra-op either by anesthesia or by the surgeon to improve the data or get it back to baseline. And basically, uh, none of those patients had a, a major neurologic deficit post-operative. Uh, some of them woke up a, a little bit weak, but they all recovered quickly. None of them had a major deficit. Whereas the 7 or 8% that we couldn't get the data back, uh, many of those patients did wake up with a major deficit. Uh, some, some did improve, uh, but some didn't. And so what we concluded from that study is uh, you do everything you can to try and get data back out of warning criteria because you will have a much better chance of that patient waking up from your surgery uh, with uh, uh, motor function at baseline. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, to me, um, uh, although it's obviously a bit um, uh, stressful when we have data that goes into warning criteria, I immediately kind of uh, regroup and think of it as an opportunity to try and save the patient's neurologic function. I've been told there's a problem, and now it's uh, the onus is on myself, and my anesthesia, and my uh, spinal cord monitoring team uh, to get the data back out of uh, in, back into uh, more normal levels and out, out of uh, warning criteria. And so, um, uh, and where there's multiple maneuvers that we do, uh, we have a checklist of things we do, and then some of this is published. Simple things like raising the blood pressure, uh, making sure the manuscript is acceptable, make sure the patient's not cold, right? Um, uh, and then obviously going through surgical things, make sure there's no compression of the dura, not too much stretch on the dura, make sure all the implants are in place, nothing's shifted with correction. If we have an overcorrect, an undercorrect, there's a variety of things we do. And invariably uh, we can, uh, with those maneuvers, uh, get the data back in, in by far over 90% of cases. Uh, if that happens, then normally uh, dynamic spinal cord mapping is not necessary. It's in those 10% of cases when the data doesn't come back or or um, we're still having trouble figuring out exactly what's, what, why we have uh, uh, data problems that I use dy dynamic spinal cord mapping, again, to try and localize more specifically what the problem is. As an example, I once did a very complex vertebral column resection at the apex uh, T89 of a, uh, a severe thoracic scoliosis. And uh, uh, I was closing down the osteotomy site, the VCR site, everything was going very well and I lost all data. Uh, and I'm decompressing the fecal sac looked fine. Uh, the, the dura didn't seem too stretched, too taut, wasn't too uh, um, uh, over compressed. And so I couldn't figure out why I, was, I had lost data. So I, I basically started mapping uh, and found out that the proximal thoracic curve above uh, was kinking the cord between T2 and T4, because basically I had no data above T2 and basically uh, T4 and below I had data. So localized to the T2, three region. Um, and I did a laminectomy and a partial pedalectomy of T3, four, and on the concavity of the proximal thoracic curve, and the data came back to baseline, the patient woke up neurologically intact. If I hadn't had that ability to, to map the spinal cord and find out specifically exactly where the problem is, I'd still be in surgery trying to figure out why, why the VCR site at T89 uh, you know, was, wasn't causing a problem, right? Because that most likely, most often that would be the problem. But my point is, 
uh, you know, when, in times when things, uh, you can't figure out what is the problem uh, or the data doesn't come back, that's when uh, dynamic spinal cord map mapping can really help the surgeon figure out uh, the problem and, and potentially solve the issue. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and those studies and, and similar ones like it, it's, it's unfortunate that, that there aren't more of them because it's the, it's those intraoperative interventions that really are informative about the therapeutic benefits of, right. of neural monitoring, not just the diagnostic benefits. Um, as a side note for just for our listeners, the, um, the epidural electrode that we're talking about here is, is one that um, is probably available in academic centers, but may require pretty significant advanced notice in some, uh, some other facilities. So if you want to try this technique, definitely reach out to your neuromonitoring team in advance so they have time to, uh, to get the appropriate supplies for, for this form of monitoring. That's a great point. Yeah, it's very simple. And that's the stimulating electrode that we record from typically the popliteal fossa, as you mentioned. And it's um, uh, the nice thing is you don't, uh, you can, uh, with, with direct um, uh, uh, ep uh, epidural stimulation, uh, and you don't, uh, even if you have um, uh, muscle relaxant on board or not, it doesn't really matter. You can still get good responses. So uh, either with or without muscle relaxant, you still record quite nicely the popliteal fossa. So benefits of this technique, uh, it's a mapping technique can be used to be localized in injury. Uh, as you said, it can be used with or without neuromuscular blockade. Um, it's uh, probably, we didn't mention this, but it's something that can be used in the context of uh, uh, severe um, uh, cerebral palsy, for example, where motor and sensory signals might otherwise be very difficult to obtain. Um, limitations. It need trained staff and specialty supplies, not a big deal, just advance notice. Right. Um, similar to SSTPs, it may, uh, may detect uh, injury when there's, um, when the dorsal columns intact, or it may not, I guess, when the dorsal right. columns right. intact. Because it is very about the dorsal columns, right? People have to remember that. Even though for some reason, it's very specific for motor function, it is obviously carried on um, retrograde by the, uh, by the dorsal column tract, right? So let's make sure people understand that. So just to close out, do you have any clinical pearls that you'd like to share with the audience uh, related to neural monitoring based on your experience? Well, again, uh, you know, there's no reason in 2021 uh, not to be using neural monitoring for really any, any spinal surgery from my perspective. And again, especially complex uh, spinal, reconstruction, spinal reconstruction or spinal deformity surgery, uh, you know, where uh, transcranial motor, motor potentials and SCPs are the standard of cure right now. And, and again, 99% of the time, they're going to give you what you need to to have a safe neurologic outcome for your patient. But uh, this dynamic spinal cord mapping, if you need to localize uh, an area um, uh, uh, on the spinal cord, it's a cervical thoracic uh, spinal cord, or columbar junction, even at the uh, uh, conus level, up down to the conus level, uh, this mapping technique can be quite beneficial. So please think about this. Uh, if you ever get stuck in a, in a quandary and you can't figure it out, because as I mentioned, it's really uh, uh, um, uh, optimal to try and uh, solve spinal cord monitoring issues in the OR if you can. Uh, and not just, uh, not just, you know, put temporary rods in and go to the CPR MRI scanner. I really like to solve it. And that's a, maybe another point that I want to bring up is that um, uh, uh, some surgeons will put temporary rods in and close the patient up and take in the MRI or CT to try and figure out what's going on. Uh, I'd rather uh, figure out right there, I'm already there. I can localize it. Literally it takes no more than five or 10 minutes to do this localization. I can go after the pathology right then and there and not wait four or five hours by the time you close the patient up, get in the MRI unit, come back to the OR, you're wasting four or five hours. Um, so if you can solve a problem uh, in the OR you're already in, that to me makes sense. So that's another thing. That's how I kind of I view this. I use it as my uh, uh, supreme MRI unit because I'm, I'm basically, I, I have access right, right then and there to, to figure out what's going on because I have access to the dural sac uh, posteriorly, lateral, and even eventually if I need to, obviously, to, to solve the problem. Yep, time is brain and time is spinal cord. Exactly, so. right. That's good. Exactly, Rich. Larry, thank you so much for taking the time again to uh, participate in our podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope our audience uh, will, uh, will learn from this and reach out to you or I if they have questions about this technique or how to apply it surgically. Absolutely, Rich. Thanks for your time. I appreciate it.